How was your Thanksgiving? I know Truman already asked you, but I'm just curious. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, my Thanksgiving was good, and I can tell you how good it was. I had to find the most generously sized shirt in my closet for today, so you're welcome. <laughs> it was good. Um, I hope you had a great time. It's nice to compare 2021 versus 2020 Thanksgiving. I think a lot of people feel a lot better this year. We have much to be thankful to God for, don't we? Yeah, it's just, he's, he's so good. Speaking of good, we've been talking about what it means to be good. I still remember a conversation I had back when I was in college with a, an acquaintance, a friend of mine. We, I was, he knew I was a Christian. I knew he wasn't. We were having a little bit of a conversation about religion, and somehow we got around to what it takes to get to heaven, and I still remember him saying, well, I'm obviously going to be there because I'm a good person. And I nodded my head just to acknowledge I'd heard him, but what I was thinking was, aren't you the guy who just described your latest exploit in the bedroom? And I know, like, you have at least two addictions that I know about, that the ones you're willing to let me know about. I want to know what your definition, I'm thinking this, what is your definition of good that you're working off of? Because you're just convinced, when I stand before God, I'm going to be okay because I'm better than a lot of the other people around me. A lot of people think that way, that the way you get to heaven is that you're a good person, and if we take it to a little bit further, that good people go to the good place and bad people go to the bad place, and we all assume that we're better than average, so we're all just assuming we're going to make it. A lot of people think that way, and I can understand why a lot of people do think that way, because it seems fair, it seems like that'd be the way that things work, but that is an assumption, right? And it's an assumption that you're basing your whole eternity on, that good people do go to heaven, if that's the way you think, and that you are a good person. It's really predicated on a couple of other assumptions. And one of them is that there actually is something after this life, that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. It's also on the assumption that God actually cares where you go or that you don't just kind of end up somewhere. So I think that we probably ought to examine those assumptions. Here at Connection, we're really con concerned with what Jesus has to say. We're very Jesus-centric here. Uh, in fact, we say our mission is to connect people to God and each other through Jesus. So I think the first thing I'd want to know is what did Jesus have to say on this subject? It seems like it's going to matter. It seems like something he might have talked about, and he actually did. If you were to have a Bible and go to Luke chapter 12, verse 4, we find Jesus saying these words, Hey, dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't do any more to you after that. I'll tell you who to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. And Jesus is pretty clear. He believes there is a hell and there is a God. It goes on, different teaching, different group of people. John chapter 5, verse 28, he said, Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I'm just looking at this, listening to Jesus in his own words. It's clear that he believes that there is a life after this one, that there is a heaven, that there is a hell, that God clearly believes that some people need to be in each place. And so we ought to take that seriously. There's a lot at stake here. I appreciate what Pastor Andy Stanley pointed out. And it's in a book, and I think it was even a sermon. It's called How Good is Good Enough. It's where I got the title for this message. By the way, I recommend the book, and it's in our library, St. Charles County Library District. So there you go. You can read it yourself. But he says this. For most people, picking a religion is like choosing the flavor of ice cream that you eat. And we pick what we like, what we're comfortable with, what suits our taste. And that's understandable, he says, but it's not very smart. The issue is not what do I like religious-wise, how was I raised, or what makes me comfortable. The real issue is what's true. Once you decide that people do live forever somewhere, he says, you're staking your eternity on what you choose to believe is true. Now, back to my colleague, that my, my friend back in college who just completely thought that he was a good person and that was going to be enough uh, I don't know where he picked that up from. I know it's a very popular viewpoint in our culture, so maybe he just picked it up that way, or maybe it just kind of logically got to that point in his own thought process that he assumed, hey, I'm good. I know a lot of people who are worse than me, so when I stand before God, just the rule of average just says I should be okay. But what if that's not exactly what God has to say about this whole matter? Uh, and if you think that way, I'm not trying to be offensive to you. I'm just trying to challenge your assumptions and, and ask you to reconsider this whole issue. I know there's a lot of people who think this way, and it does seem logical and fair that you should be rewarded for doing good in this life, and it also seems logical and fair that people who have consistently done evil, as Jesus said, persistently stayed in evil, should be punished for that. Uh, it seems logical, it seems fair, it seems like a, the reasonable thing. And uh, I like what C.S. Lewis said about this. He said, you know, if you think about it, uh, heaven for mosquitoes and hell for bad people could be the same place, and that would work out really well. 
So maybe that's what God has in mind. I don't know. Yeah, and, and another thing about this, if you think about it, if this is really how it is, what better motivation do you need than, you know, if you don't want to go to the bad place, you better be good. So maybe God made it that way, I don't know, so that everybody would behave themselves. I don't know if that's how people assume that this is how it works. And I, I also get it that most of the world's religions think this way. Just take a scan of any other teaching out there, and a lot of them pretty much boil down to what you do in life determines what happens to you afterwards. So a lot of people hold this viewpoint, but what if it's not true? And then I have another question about this. Assuming that this is how it is, how in the world will you know that you're okay? You know, again, as Pastor Andy Stanley asks, how good is good enough? Do you really want to go through your whole life wondering if you've made the cut, if you've done enough? Do you just live your whole life just stressed out? That maybe, maybe today I'm going to heaven, tomorrow I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be bad tomorrow, so, you know, better make up for it the day after that. Think about it this way. How hard is it to get on a pro athlete, athletic team? Like, like in the NFL, how hard is it to play in the NFL? You have people, you probably, or maybe you are one of these people, or you knew people in high school who were just phenomenal athletes, just, were just a dream to watch. And in college, they were amazing, and they never made it to the NFL, right? What is it now, like 90 people are allowed to go to training day, training camp, and what do they cut it down to, like 53 by the end of it, by the first game? I remember Lovey Smith back in early St. Louis Rams, back when Kurt Warner was still here, and for a while he was coaching up in Chicago with the Bears, and he would talk to the rookies when they would come in. And like one year, there were 19 rookies on the starting lineup of about 90. And he knew that basically about seven of them were still going to be there on starting day. So he was talking to them, trying to motivate them. And they're all wondering the same thing. How do I make the team? Because I'm surrounded by all these amazing athletes who are here, and they're just as hungry as I am. I'm surrounded by all these veterans who are going to keep their spot on the team because they're just playing at a world-class level. And so Lovey's as a coach, saying to all these rookies, you want to know, how do I stay on the team? He says, take the decision out of our hands. In other words, you just come into this camp and you play so hard, you hit every play as hard as you can, you run as fast as you can, you say yes, coach, and you do more than what you're asked to every single time so that you are so good, our coaches can't imagine not having you on our team. And think about, is that how God is? Does he look at you and say, you got a lifetime, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. I'm just going to tell you, you better do your best. And if you think you've done your best, you better stop and think again. Don't leave the decision in my hands. That's what a lot of people actually think. Because when you think about it, when you say that good people go to heaven, who's responsible for getting you to heaven? You are. When you adopt that mindset, what you're saying is, getting me into heaven or not is fully in my hands, and I better work really hard and every day, I better be good. And I know I've done some bad days and I've had some cheat days, so I'm going to have to really buckle down the next day. And I, I think about this and I think how sad that is because that is absolutely not the biblical uh, teaching. God doesn't look at us and say, it's all on you and, you know, good luck with that and just figure it out. It's actually to the opposite. If you want to find Titus in your Bible, we're going to wrap it up today. And if you have not really heard some of these things, uh, or if, you, if you've gone through your life thinking that it really depends on your own goodness, this may be the best day you've ever had. I've got some good news for you. Starting in uh, chapter 3, verse 4, the Apostle Paul wrote to Titus, who was pastor over churches on the island of Crete, full of people who'd come out of a lifestyle that was just awful, and they needed to learn to be good people. And Paul just reminded Titus, you need to remind the people of where their help really comes from. When God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us and the confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Wow, did you notice that? According to Paul, it has absolutely nothing to do with how good you are as to whether you get into heaven. God can takes complete responsibility and, I, you know, just thinking about this, when you say, it's really up to me if I'm going to be in heaven, 
God looks at that the same way a pilot on an airplane might look at you when you say, well, we got to lift our feet off the floor before we take off to help the pilot out. <laughs> it has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you're going to get off the ground, nor does it have anything to do with whether or not God's going to accept you as to whether how good you are or not. When you talk about this, it's, it's grace that gets you to heaven. And what are we talking about when we talk about grace? It's a free gift. It's something you don't earn. It's certainly something you don't deserve. You just accept it and say, thank you. I don't know who first said it this way, but man, it always stuck with me. You know, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. You get two distinct pathways. You can try to get to heaven on your own goodness. Good luck with that. But why would you want to play in that ballpark when you don't have to, when God doesn't expect it of you, when it's not ever going to work, when it's simply a gift that he wants to give you? How does it work? Well, let's go back and look through these verses again, because Paul just lays it out. It's, it starts with God's mercy. It's not according to our righteousness. He says he washed away our sins. He gave us, gave us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. You ever wanted a fresh start and a clean slate? Somebody just kind of wipe everything out and give you a do-over? That's it right there. This is what happens when you become a Christian. The old is gone and the new has come. God makes you a completely new person. He uh, generously pours out the Holy Spirit on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the Holy Spirit of God living within you helps you coaches you, walks alongside you, and nudges you, and empowers you to do things you could never do on your own. And you, some of you who are Christians, you can stand up here and tell stories, if you would, about how you know, I used to be like this, and now somehow I'm like this, and I don't know when it happened, but I've become a different person. And maybe you still look and you go, I know how far I still have to go, but you know it wasn't you. Then it was God working in you and through you. You know the Holy Spirit's changing you, and that, that's how it works. That's what he does. And I love what Paul went on and said in verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying. I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. What's the order here? First you trust God, then you do good. It's not, okay, I do good, and then maybe God accepts me. He already accepts you. He already loves you. He already can't imagine heaven without you, and he wants you there. And it's up to you saying, now, because I am loved and I am accepted and I am changing, I'm going to live up to what God already thinks of me, what he's called me to. I'm going to learn to grow up because that's how we do things in this family. And this is just exactly what you would expect from a good father. I appreciate another story that Andy Stanley tells about his family when his kids were little. He got a used Infiniti. He says, for him, the nicest car he'd ever had. It was in mint condition, and he babied that thing. He wanted to keep it pristine. <laughs> if you've had kids or you are a kid, how, what are the chances that your car is going to say in its mint condition? No, you're going to find French fries in places you don't want to find them. But he tried, bless his heart. One Saturday morning, Andy was carrying a trash bag through the garage to put it outside, and he noticed on the hood of his new car, someone had scratched a big A, and then there were scribbles after it. He immediately called out his two sons, and they were little boys, but he called them out, and he had a little come-to-Jesus meeting. Boys, do you know anything about this? And there was silence in heaven for 30 minutes. (laughs) There's nothing. Finally, his five-year-old son threw his three-year-old sister under the bus. Allie did it. Well, Allie didn't do it. Andy calls Allie out to the garage. Do you know anything about this, Allie? Yes, sir, Daddy. Did you do this, Allie? Yes, sir, Daddy. And it clicked. She was writing her name on Daddy's car. How do you hold a three-year-old accountable for something like this? Do you just lecture her and yell at her and say, do you know how much money this is going to cost me because insurance is not going to cover this and I'm going to have to rent a car and take this to be fixed and I'm going to be inconvenienced and it probably won't look as good as it used to. You're going to be paying for this for the next 20 years of your life. Forget college. You've got to pay the... What parent would do that? What good parent would do that? Andy said he did the only thing that any good father could do or should do. He got down on his knee in front of Allie and said, Allie, honey, don't do that ever again, okay? Yes, sir, Daddy. Ran back in the house. In what world could a three-year-old pay that back? How absurd would it be for him to expect her to do something she never could do? So he did what any good parent would do. Took the cost on himself. Fixed it himself. 
Look, you and I, and put myself in this, we owe God a debt that we could never pay back. You don't have enough years. You don't have enough lifetimes to do enough good things to make up for even one of the bad things you've done. And God looks at you and he knows you can't. And he could have just closed the door on all of us, said, I'll just start over, cut his losses. He wasn't willing to do that. Because he loves you, because he loves me, he loves everyone who's ever lived. God wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He stepped into the mess and he said, look, I will pay for this myself. I will become one of you. I will live 33 years with you. I will let you kill me and my life will be a sacrifice and a substitute for you. And I will come back to life and I will offer you eternal life. And the only thing I want from you is not to earn it. This isn't like the end of Saving Private Ryan, earn this live up to it. In light of what I've done for you, let me save you. Let me change you. Let me give you a fresh start. Let me teach you how to live. And Jesus is the most patient teacher I've ever known. And he will transform you. And that's the process. And this is what God wants to do for us. I love this verse. It's out of Ephesians in the Bible. And if you want to look at it, you can. It'll be up on the screen. And it's very simple. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. No, we're God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can go do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. God's got a plan for your life. It starts with changing you. It includes you doing all kinds of wonderful things. And it has nothing to do with whether or not God likes you on that given day has everything to do with he wants you to get back to the place you should have been. You're broken, and so am I. But God will restore you. And somehow you might even be more glorious for having been broken and fixed. And God wants to have an amazing story with your life to say, look what I've done with you. Look how I've transformed you. And it gives him glory. It gives you great joy. And you have this wonderful peace in your life that you never had before when God gets involved in your life. So when did God save you? Was it when you cleaned up your act? Was it when you finally, you know, went to church 52 times in a year, gave enough offering, went to AA, you know, whatever it was? Started with him. He's already made up his mind that he loves you and he wants you in his family. It's up to you to respond to that. Now, I want to go back to something that I read at the beginning. I was talking about something Jesus taught, and there might be a little bug in the back of your mind that's going, I think I see something that doesn't quite match up here. Let me just go ahead and read it again, and I'll point it out if you haven't seen it already. Back in John 5, 29, Jesus said, those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. And I know there might be something in your mind saying, it sounds a little bit to me, Brian, like Jesus is saying that if you do good, you get to go to heaven. And if you do bad, you get, you know, it's kind of like it's Oprah. You done good, eternal life, eternal life, eternal life, eternal, not for you, eternal life, not for you, eternal. But is that what Jesus is really saying? Let me show you why he's not. I pulled this verse out of a bigger teaching and we need the fuller context. Let's just go, same group of people, just a few sentences before Jesus said this back in verse 24. Same conversation, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in the God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they've already passed from death to life. When Jesus says, I want you to do good so that you get eternal life, the good thing he has in mind is just that you believe him, that you trust him, that you ask him for help. And if you don't believe me, let me just tell you some more that Jesus said. Over in John chapter 6, different group of people, Jesus said in verse 29, the only work God wants from you is this, believe in the one he has sent. And he's talking about Jesus himself. In verse 40, for it's my father's will that all who see his son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. What's the thing that Jesus expects from you? Just trust him. Just believe him. Accept what he's done for you. Don't go, uh, I'm going to be the good person that God always wanted, and I'm going to be the one kid who actually makes him happy and proud, and and I'll be the one person who's in heaven because they actually belong there. You can't do it, and God doesn't expect you to. Just trust Jesus. What does that look like in real life? I like stories. They help me understand things. That's why I tell so many stories with you all. And there's a beautiful picture in the book of Acts about the first people who responded to Jesus and what it looked like for them to trust him. 
In Acts chapter two, the apostle Peter, who spent a lot of time with Jesus, and in fact had failed Jesus spectacularly just about a month and a half before, is now preaching this powerful sermon to thousands of people. And they wanted to know what to do to get right with God. They knew that they had done some horrible things. And they're asking Peter and the other apostles who were with him, what do we need to do? In Acts 2.38, here's what Peter told them to do. Y'all need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you do that, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, And he goes on, he says, look, this is not just for you all. This is for everyone who hears this. Jesus message and Jesus' hope is for everyone. Just repent and be baptized. And you look at that and you go, okay, so what does it look like to believe in him? Well, Peter said, you you believe in him and you put your faith and your trust in him by repenting. It's something that goes on in your mind, first of all, to just go, the way I've been thinking about life is just not right. And I've run into some new information from Jesus and I'm going to change the way I think about things. And I'm actually going to start trying to change my life. You, by the way, you start to try to do the right thing, you're going to realize real quick that you need some help with that. And, and God's more than willing to help you with that. But you repent. You change your direction. You change your way of thinking. And it's an internal kind of a thing. But then you don't just leave it inside. There's an external response, too. Peter said, be baptized. And that word literally means to be plunged underwater. And people who say yes to Jesus, it's what we've been doing for 2,000 years. They go and they say, I believe Jesus is my Lord. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. They get in water and they are immersed in water. Some of you have experienced that. Many of you have. Some of you are newer to what it means to be a Jesus follower. And you may not even have seen somebody be immersed. But what that is, is it's a visible expression that there's a new direction in my life. There's a new leader in my life. I'm trusting him for my salvation. And when you are baptized in water, when you're buried under the water, it's like a burial. He talks about the new life he wants to give you. When someone goes under the water, it's almost like you're leaving the old person behind like a burial, like Jesus was buried. When you come back up, it's like a resurrection. And there's nothing magical about the water. There's nothing magical. We don't put special Jordan River water in it and we don't, say, and you're like, God's a real person, right? This isn't magic. It's in that moment that God says, I want to link something together for you. It's no more you know, magical than when you put a ring on your finger and say in front of all your friends, I commit to this person for a lifetime. It's that moment where you say, I'm all in. I trust Jesus. I'm not going to trust myself. I'm not going to trust, you know, that my parents and my grandparents were wonderful Christians and that should be good enough. I'm just going to accept what Jesus has done for me. I'm going to accept that he's going to change my life. And uh, I love what it says in the Bible in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you openly declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are hard to understand. Grace is not one of them. It's a free gift. It's it. God is willing to do for you what you've never done on your own. Make you a good truly good person. And there will be a day in your future where you're going to realize, man, I am so glad I just said thank you. Just took, take the gift and run. Just, just do it. I don't know what gets in the way. Maybe for you, you are not a Christian. Today would be a great day. I'm just telling you, you'd have a lot to be thankful for if you said in 2021, I'm going to say yes to Jesus. That's what we're here to do. We're here to help people. We've helped hundreds of people say yes to Jesus. Maybe you are ready to do that. We're here to help you. I would encourage you just to have the courage to take a next step towards him. Don't let pride get in the way. Like, I should figure this out myself. Um, You know, what are people going to say about me if I do? You know what they're going to say is you're smart. You're turning to a power higher than yourself and better than yourself. You're turning to the one source of salvation in life. I'd invite you, do something with this. And maybe you're still newer and you're thinking about that. That's okay. Uh, We're here to help you along the way. And I guarantee if you'll open your heart and pray about this, that God's going to encourage you and you're going to find some insight that you would never have found before. When you humble yourself and you accept that help from God, It's power that will open up in you that just change your life. And God really wants you to be a truly good person. His dream is to create a people that are his own, a family where everyone in the family wants to do good or is eager to do what's good. To just say, what's the next right thing I need to do? I'm ready to do that. Sign me up for that. I'm so excited to be among a church and a congregation where I see people's lives changing like that. And I'm just praying that for you. And hey, if you already are a Christian and you feel like, man, I just, maybe I need to do this again. 
you just need to repent. Repentance is something that you do every day. If you feel like you've fallen off the horse and fallen off the wagon, just get back on. And God still accepts you. He's still changing you. You're still growing. You're still moving forward. Jesus didn't abandon you because one day you had a bad day. We're all here for one another. Reach out to someone and ask for help. Reach out to the Lord. Uh, I would pray for you now. And I would just invite you to have a conversation with God where you just open to him. What do I need to do next? Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that you are so good. In fact, we learn what it is to be good by watching you. And I'm thankful that you know everything about us and still are willing to invite us to be part of your family. Thankful to be part of a group like this where we are truly watching one another change and grow and helping each other, picking each other up when we fall. I ask just today that you would open our hearts to you and to each other. We just truly know and see what it is you ask of us and we would just respond to your love. Pray all this in Jesus' name.